It's been between two and three minutes. You know what that means. It must be time for more Follow the Money with Mitch Moss and Paulie Howard on Sirius XM 204. All right, this is going to be a lot of fun. Professional gambler Richard Munchkin joins the program now, author of the book Gambling Wizards, host of the podcast Gambling with an Edge. Richard, thanks for the time today. Good morning. How are you? Really well, thank you. Yep, let's start. How are you doing? Do, doing well. We have a brand new audience now on in Nesson in Boston. Also, you can uh, stream this show on on Sling and Fubo. It's been a long time since we've had you on the program. You were in Hollywood working in show business. Take us back to the very beginning of this when you actually thought to yourself, you know what, maybe there's a spot for me to turn into a gambler. When and how did that actually take place? So I grew up outside Chicago and. Um, uh, I, we were uh, game players. Uh, my family always, we were game players. I started playing uh, chess when I was three and gin rummy. My grandmother taught me. And uh, my older brother, when I was in high school, invited some friends over to play poker. And they asked me if I wanted to join. And uh, we literally were playing for nickels and dimes. And at the end of it, I had won $5.20. And it was like the heavens opened and the angels began to sing. And I thought, oh, my God, I could actually make money playing cards. Um, And I, you know, my next thing was I went to the library the next day and I checked out every book they had on poker. And uh, that was really kind of how it started. Then then what happened was um, I... My, I went to college there in Chicago, and my degree was in theater, but my plan was to – I wasn't willing to go to Hollywood and wash dishes at night to be an actor. So my plan was to go to Las Vegas and put together a bankroll and, and then go to L.A. Um, mm-hmm. And and uh, I had taken up backgammon. I was also playing backgammon at that point for money, and um, I met a dentist – who now this is the 1970s and he told me he had just come back from Vegas and that he had a system for winning a blackjack. And I was like, Oh yeah, right. You know, I rolled my eyes and he told me, no, 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 this is math. You know, and he explained about counting cards and I thought, well, that sounds plausible. Uh, so he recommended a book called playing blackjack as a business, which I went and I had to special order and um, I wasn't 21 yet, but I, I read the book and I thought this, you know, this makes sense. And this is right up my alley. Uh, so my plan was when I moved to Las Vegas, I didn't really have a large bankroll. So I thought I would get a job as a blackjack dealer. And that way I could practice counting cards eight hours a day. Mm. What better, you know, what better way to learn? And and pretty much that's what's happened. And I I came here, I started uh, dealing blackjack and counting cards, and after a few years, I was making more money playing blackjack than I was dealing it, so I had to quit the job. That is a great answer. Yes, it is. That is excellent. I know, Mike. Yeah. So when do you take it to the next level where then it becomes more than blackjack, you have teams, and you are scouting all over the country? Well, uh, so remember, at that when I started, there was no all over the country. Yeah. Atlantic City hadn't even opened yet. Uh, yeah. And um, but but um, as I was dealing, what happened was I met an Australian uh, card counter who had a team, and he recruited me. And so I started playing with the team, and then that's when I quit my job. And at that time, uh, we were playing, you know, just. The- Vegas and Reno. Um, And then um, eventually you get kind of burned out and you have to look for other places. So I started, I went to Europe and down into the Caribbean and then over into Asia. And, you know, it just expanded from there over the years. How much, how many times in the good old days, what are we talking in terms of hours and and how much would would go into scouting and what would you look for in ways you could win in good games and and things to take advantage of? Well, in the beginning, there wasn't a lot of scouting because all I knew how to do was count cards. Um, But I realized pretty quickly that counting cards has the lowest advantage and the highest amount of heat. 
So mm. pretty quickly, we wanted to, to uh, increase the advantage and decrease the heat. And the first thing we kind of uh, shifted into was called shuffle tracking. And what that um, is is a method of keeping track of the cards after they've been shuffled. Um, this really isn't possible now because they use machines to shuffle the cards in so many places. But um, what that allowed us to do was make our big bets at the beginning of the shoe, which is the opposite of what a card counter looks like. So, um, you know, that was the beginning, and then it kind of shifted into more uh, complicated plays. And th the other thing that's been a tremendous boon to advantage players is they have started introducing all these what they call carnival games. And there are just dozens and dozens of these new games, and often these games can be exploited by players who know what they're doing. And they have the added benefit of the advantages can get much, much higher. And the casinos tend not to sweat these games at all because they think they're just for the suckers. And so, so that's been a, a tremendous boon for advantage players. What's your most memorable win? You know, um, as I think as most professional gamblers will tell you uh, that it's not really about the big score. Um, you know, professional gambling is a grind. Mm -hmm. You're out there putting in the hours and, and uh, you know, but one of, one of the most memorable was, and, and I was much younger, so that the amount of money uh, was much more significant to me at the time. But my brother and I went to a casino in Busan, Korea, and on Friday night, we won $100,000. And on Saturday and Sunday, we lost it all back. Mm. And, you know, that was, that was the 80s when $100,000 was a lot more money back then than it is today. A whole ton of cash. Then I will, so then what's your most devastating beat? Boy, you know, um, I think it was when I very first joined the team and I was just counting cards and I, I lost for 160 hours oh. and it was devastating because a, I had teammates and I felt like I was really letting them down. B I was new to counting and I just kept thinking I was doing something wrong that I must not be doing it right because my teammates were winning and I would just lose and lose and lose. And so I, I kept having them come with me to the casino and sit at the table and test me to make sure I was doing it right. Mm. And I, I kept passing the test. They kept saying, no, you're doing it right. Just keep playing. And, but, but that was really, really uh, a difficult period. And actually, at the end of the 160 hours, the bankroll ended. And I said, you know what? I quit. I'm going back to work. This, this doesn't work. <laughs> oh, God. And, uh, and so I was, you know, dealing. I was still dealing blackjack. And um, my friend on the team joined another team. And they just started winning like crazy. And after uh, about three months, he came and said, look, you've got to give this another try. We're just making money so fast. It's ridiculous. And uh and I said, okay, I'll, I'll give it another shot. And and so I started playing again, and and then I started winning, and mm. and it kind of took off from there. So I really owe that friend a tremendous mm. debt of gratitude for uh, for making me go give it a second try. Follow the money, Paulie and Mitch Nesson, Fubo Sling Veasan, our guest Richard Munchkin, professional gambler. Follow him on Twitter and uh, author of the book Gambling Wizards, and also the podcast with Bob Dancer, Gambling with an Edge. Have you had to resort ever to a disguise, and were you ever backroomed? Um, you know, I was never backroomed because I, I think it was a tremendous advantage having worked in the casino. And I think I often would spot the problems before that before it was too late and was usually out the door. Okay. Um, the one time was in Korea where it was the nicest barring I ever had. They invited me to a back room, which was the casino manager's office and invited me for tea <laughs> and we sat down and had tea and I could tell the guy it was really awkward and the guy was embarrassed 
And after about five minutes of drinking tea, he told me, you know, we're very sorry, but you cannot play here anymore. <laughs> and um, so so that was really my only backrooming. And, uh, wow. and that's about as nice as backrooming can get. Um, as for disguises, uh, almost all of us have uh, played with that at one time or another. And uh, it's just so much of a hassle um, that it, everybody ends up abandoning it. The, you know, the things that we do are... Uh, changing our hair. You know, my hair has been every different color and curly and straight and short and long and growing facial hair and contact lenses and, you know, those kind of mm -hmm. things, which are fairly easy. But I I'll tell you, um, one of my teammates um, really needed disguise. And I mentioned we were playing a lot in Korea. So I got a uh, Hollywood special effects makeup person and she created this disguise for him where he had tape next to his eyes that would pull his eyes back to make him look Asian and a uh, skin tint to make his skin a little bit darker and, and a black wig. And you had to put the skin on your, I mean, the tint on your hands too, so it would match. And, and there were these little pieces, these little rubber tubes that you would stick inside your nose that would make your nostrils look bigger and your nose flatter. And anyway, he just said, I feel really conspicuous and ridiculous in this disguise. Like, I think it just looks totally, totally fake. <laughs> and so he goes to Korea. He puts on the disguise. He get, goes out of the hotel room. He gets in the elevator. And a guy looks at him and says, what part of India are you from? <laughs> and he was like, well, <laughs> well I guess this is going to work. <laughs> you wow. know." But the other bad thing about it was as you start to sweat, you know, the, the tint would start to run and your hands would get on the on the table and the chips and stuff. It was just such a pain that, as I say, everybody I know who's dabbled with disguises has ended up abandoning them. Uh, you uh, you tweeted about this and you've talked about it on the podcast. How do you feel about the new free roll, as you say, at where casinos? Well, if you lose, good for us. But if you win, we're not going to pay you. Phil Ivey, the story you tweeted about in Singapore where the guy lost $30 million. He has it in writing that the dealer continued to make mistakes, and they said, okay, we'll come back and play. He goes, I'm not paying if he continues to make mistakes, and then they want the money. Uh, what do you think about what some of these casinos are doing now with the free roll, as you called it? Well, yeah, that's uh, people ask me, you know, I, I get the question a lot, did casinos cheat? And mm -hmm. um, my answer is that the way they cheat now is they just don't pay you. Um, so here's another example that I think is, you know, particularly egregious. The casinos now, in an effort to save time, use pre-shuffled cards. So they buy the cards. They've already been shuffled by the manufacturer. So a casino in Atlantic City puts these shoes, these cards in a Baccarat shoe and starts dealing. And the, the players realize that the casino hasn't shuffled the cards. So it's coming out five of diamonds, six of diamonds, seven of diamonds, eight of diamonds, oh. like that. <laughs> and so these players, a lot of them are just small-time betters. By the end of the shoe, they're all betting table max, which I think was $5,000 a hand. And the casino, they have a dealer there dealing the game, a pit boss watching the game, surveillance watching the game, and none of them notice this. And now the players, I think, I, I don't remember exactly. I think combined they won a million and a half or something. And uh, now the casino detains them and sues them to get the money back and doesn't want to pay. So, you know, that's just an example of, of you know, the, the way they're doing it. Another one, this, it's particularly bad in the U.K. right now. I think they're emboldened because of that Phil Ivey case. Yeah. Now there have been several players in the UK where the the players have won money and the casino says, we're not paying you. We're keeping your money because this is a private club and it's against the rules for you to count cards. You are counting cards. Therefore, we're keeping your money. So it's a complete oh. free roll for the casino, right? right? If you lose, yeah. they're not going to say, oh, by the way, you were counting cards. That's against the rules. We're going to give you your money back. No, they just, you know, basically steal your money and, you know. Uh, how about, the, how about a, the false shuffle and also what you were talking about this in Louisiana? You're not allowed to ban card counters, but they're still doing that. Yeah, 
Yeah, so they're just flouting the law. You know, um, they passed a law like Atlantic City, like Missouri, have laws where you're not allowed to bar someone just for using their brain. But in Louisiana, they're just doing it anyway. So until somebody sues them and, you know, makes them start following the law, that's that's just what they're doing down there. Hmm. Uh, we're talking to Richard Munchkin on VSIN. Okay, so your thoughts then and opinion on new corporate Las Vegas with all of these silly parking fees. You know, we broadcast live from the South Point every single day. Michael Gaughan's too good of a guy to actually ever charge for parking fees, so it's never going to happen here, but most of the Strip does. And also the resort fees that completely get out of hand. You know, um, I think the casinos have shot themselves in the foot because they just don't understand the gambling business. And they, the revenue from gambling is just nowhere near what it should be because the casinos are so poorly run. Michael Gaughan is the best operator in Las Vegas. He understands that you give people what Benny Binion understood. You give people cheap food, cheap drinks, cheap rooms, uh, you know, and you make your money from the gambling. So, you know, it used to be that the majority of the money and the revenue in the casinos came from the gambling. And now it's down under 35 percent a lot of these places. They want to make money off the rooms and the food and the shows and the nightclubs. Uh, You know, I I just don't think that they are making anywhere near what they could be making if they understood how how to properly run these places. Yeah. What some spots charge for drinks nowadays. I mean, it's. You can go to a spot. I'm not put it this way. I'm not surprised anymore if I get charged 15 bucks for a beer, which is just completely outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Can you comment on the uh, on the uh, hammer technique and that Esquire article about how that guys were doing that playing in teams and how that was working out with hand signals or as best? Is that what you guys were doing or if you can elaborate on the hammer technique? Um, yeah. And uh, now this Esquire article that you're uh-huh. that you're talking about, I mean, I think it's 15 or 20 years yeah. old. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, an article about a guy named Rob Wrightson, who is the latest inductee into the Blackjack Hall of Fame. Um, but anyway, the, the hammer technique was kind of one step up above shuffle tracking. It was a way of keeping track of sequences of cards and through the shuffle. And particularly aces, because if you know that one of your cards is going to be an ace, you have over a 50% advantage. So um, that was the technique he was using in that article. Um, They they won half a million dollars in one weekend using that technique. Um, It's a very, very powerful technique, although it's a very difficult game to find now because... Um, as I mentioned before, so many of the places are using machines to shuffle the cards. And, and that's a technique that really depends on the shuffle not being very thorough and the shuffle not being random. Mm. Okay, fair enough. You also host the podcast Gambling with an Edge with Bob Dancer. This might be a tough one to answer, but you've had a lot of interesting characters uh, on the podcast, does anybody stick out at, at maybe uh, as maybe like the most you know interesting person or gambler that you've ever talked to on that uh, on, on you know gambling with an edge? Um, well, uh, to, one of the most interesting people that's been on the show for me definitely is Billy Baxter. Uh, you know, he's a famous sports better poker player that's been around here forever, um, and he just has you know some amazing stories. And uh, But the other thing, uh, one of the shows that, a couple of the shows that are really memorable, one of the things I'm proud of about the show is we have had guests um, talk about how to beat almost every game imaginable, every single game in the casino. And I'm not talking about lucky numbers or voodoo or any of that. I'm talking about solid mathematics where you have an edge at almost every game you can think of including slot machines, including Kino, I mean, everything. But um, two of the most memorable, one is a guy who figured out how to beat the lottery, scratch off lottery oh. tickets. Oh. And um, we had him on twice. And, uh, you know, he, uh, being a math guy, 
his, he was, he's not a gambler. So his first thought was not, oh, man, I can make millions of dollars with this. His first thought was, oh, they have designed their game poorly. I should tell them. And so he contacted the lottery and he said, there's a problem with your game. And I can tell which are winners and which are not. And they were like, yeah, yeah thanks. And <laughs> totally dismissed him. So he took two envelopes and he put um, 10 tickets in one and 10 tickets in the other that had not been scratched off. And on one, he wrote losers. On the other, he wrote winners. And he sent them back. And um, he was nine out of 10 on the winners and 10 out of 10 on the losers. Oh, man. And when they got it, they contacted him immediately and said, you know, what's going on here? Um, but to my knowledge, they still didn't fix the game. And uh, you can find articles about this guy uh, in, in Wired magazine. But um, it, it, if you want, if listeners want to hear those episodes, his name was Mohan Sarvastava. And uh, you can find episodes at gamblingwithanedge.com. The other one that I thought was really interesting was a guy. I'm sorry, are we running out of time? Yeah, you know, Richard, sorry, we put you up against the clock. That, that We got to end up, you know, we'll end on a high note because that's an incredible story. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you for coming on today. We really appreciate it all. Sure, absolutely. Anytime. Yep. Thank, thank you, sir. You. There you well go. Done. Richard at, Munchkin. At RWM21 on Twitter. Yep. And those are great stories like that and all the podcasts up on the website. Author of Gambling Wizards. And again, the podcast is uh, Gambling with an Edge. In Pocket Plays coming up next.